everlasting God. Your Son is the light of the world. Your Son is the way, the truth, and the life. Lead us by your light and truth. Looking for Jesus, let us find him. Looked for by Jesus, we are found first. Let us worship together, and as we gather together, we know that our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. And now grace to you and peace from God Almighty and Jesus Christ, our Lord, through the powerful work of God's Holy Spirit. Amen. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. The one who follows me will not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. We light these candles as a sign of the coming light of Christ. People who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in the land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. I will lead the blind by a road they do not know. By paths they have not known, I will guide them. I will turn the darkness before them into light, the rough places into level ground. These are the things I will do, and I will not forsake them. The Lord says to his servant, It is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the survivors of Israel. I will give you as a light to the nations that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. Then your light shall break forth like the dawn and your healing shall spring up quickly. Your vindicator shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For the darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness of the people. But the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory will appear over you. Nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Come, Lord Jesus, our light and our salvation. Let us walk in the light of the Lord.
celebrate that Jesus, our Lord, came to earth as a human being, just like us, but without sin. He came so that we who sin may be freed from sin. With the peace that comes from knowing Jesus, let us confess our sins and be forgiven. Let us pray. When we allow darkness to overcome the light, forgive us, Lord. When we reduce Christmas to plastic and tinsel, have mercy on us, Father. When hardness of heart keeps us from seeing and hearing and touching, let your grace consume us, O God. When the walls around us are of no concern, forgive us, Lord, and move us to compassion for those who suffer. When our caring is not extended to action, move us to seek justice for our brothers and sisters. We come to confess our sinfulness before you and before each other. We are but dust without your love. Remove all barriers that divide us, and let there be no obstacle to our love for you and for one another. Amen. God, hear these words of good news from Matthew and 1 Timothy. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. In Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. And then how do we respond? How do we show our gratitude for God's love and mercy and forgiveness? These words from Ephesians give us good guidance on how we ought to live. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Our Psalter is Psalm 96. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. He is to be revered above all gods, for all the gods of the peoples are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before him, strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples, Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in holy splendor. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord is king. The world is firmly established. It shall never be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens be glad, and let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar, and all that fills it. Let the field exult, and everything in it. Then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord, for he is coming, for he is coming to judge the earth. 
He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with his truth. Christmas. It's time for a Christmas Eve word for the children. Tonight, I want to tell you a story about the most special Christmas present. Once upon a time, God asked a teenaged girl named Mary if she would help give a gift to the whole world. Mary said yes, and so one night in Bethlehem, the gift was delivered. Who do you think the gift might be? Mary took strips of cloth and wrapped up the gift, nice and snug, and she spent many years taking very good care of God's gift to the whole world. Just as children like to peek at presents by lifting a corner of the paper, Many people got a peek at God's gift to the world. A woman from Cana was one. This woman was an outsider with a troubled daughter who went to Jesus several times and asked if Jesus might heal her daughter. The woman got a peek at the hope God's gift brings to the world when Jesus agreed to heal her daughter. Jesus' helpers also got a peek at God's gift when they were in a boat out on the lake and a storm came. The winds blew and the waves were high and Jesus' friends were scared. So they woke Jesus up and saw God's gift to the world when Jesus told the storm to be still and the waters became peaceful. A blind man who had never seen anything at all since birth got a peek at God's gift to the world when Jesus spat in the dirt, put mud on his eyes, and the blind man could see. God's gift brought the blind man great joy. One day, a little man climbed a tree because he wanted to see Jesus. He was a tax collector and disliked by many people. The little man got a peek of the love of Jesus. When Jesus reached out to him, someone unloved by many, and had dinner at his house. The Bible tells us, God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son, Anyone who believes in him will not die, but will have eternal life. God did not send his son into the world to judge the world. He sent his son to save the world through him. People got peaks at the hope and peace and love and joy that God's gift would bring. This gift was Christ, the Messiah sent to save us all. Emmanuel, God is with us. Christ the Lord is God's perfect gift. Merry Christmas. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior, who gives us hope, peace, joy, and love. May we share these gifts at Christmas 
and all through the year. Amen. God has shown us the meaning of generosity in the beautiful diversity of creation, in the overflowing love of Jesus Christ, in the never-ending gift of the Holy Spirit. God has abundantly blessed us and called us to be a community that honors each other, to serve others with joy, to share our love and material possessions. Let us rejoice in what we have been given and what is ours to give. Let us pray. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, maker of all things. Through your goodness you have blessed us with these gifts. With them we offer ourselves to your service and dedicate our lives to the care and redemption of all that you have made for the sake of him 
who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now hear the word of God. Our first reading is from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 9, verses 1 through 7, the righteous reign of the coming king. But there will be no gloom for those who were in anguish. In the former time he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, but in the latter time he will make glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, 
Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as people exult when dividing plunder. For the yoke of their burden and the bar across their shoulders, the rot of their oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For all the boots of the trampling warriors and all the garments rolled in blood shall be burnt as fuel for the fire. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us. Authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually, and there shall be endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. He will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time onwards and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. reading from the epistle of Titus, chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all, training us to renounce impiety and worldly passions, and in the present age to live lives that are self-controlled, upright, and godly, while we wait for the blessed hope and the manifestation of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He it is who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify for himself a people of his own who are zealous for good deeds. Our gospel reading, the gospel according to Luke, chapter 2, verses 1 through 20, the birth of Jesus. In those days, a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to the city of David called Bethlehem, because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child, and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. In that region there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace among those whom he favors. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. When they saw this, 
And they made known what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A few years ago, to celebrate International Youth Day, youth ambassadors of the world were asked, if there is one thing you could change in the world, what would that be? Here are some of the youth ambassadors' answers. Khalid from the UK, I'd make the world a fairer and peaceful place to live. Lina from France, Gender Inequalities in Girls' Education. AJ from the U.S. I would make people more empathetic. Bryant from the Netherlands. I would create more education and training opportunity for vulnerable youth. Christian from Nigeria. I would change the process that leads to the refugee crisis. And Benedict from Belgium. I would make sure that everybody, all the children, have the same opportunities, the opportunity to become who they want to be. The same question was asked to famous and successful people. One said he would end the war on drugs. Another said she would fix the unemployment problem. There was one who said he would kill the weekly office meeting, and one would change how we think about careers. And one would give every child a quality education from the start. What would you change to make the future better? Ending the pandemic? Curing cancer? Eliminating poverty and hunger? Ending wars, racism, intolerance, and inequality are some that come to mind. And all of these are indeed important because they are a strain on our collective humanity. There really is no need that someone is judged by the color of her skin and not by her character. This beautiful and fertile creation certainly can provide more than enough for all and not just for a few. There is something else that I personally would wish for our world. If I could change one thing, It would be that all people are excited about the future instead of fearing it. You see, almost everybody fears the uncertainty of the future. The prospect of not knowing if something good or bad will happen to you in the near future can produce a lot of anxiety and fear. People generally fear the future for they cannot predict or control it. There's even a word for it. Chronophobia is defined as the persistent and often irrational fear of the future. Because people fear the uncertainty and unpredictability of the future, they either idealize the past or they hang on to the status quo and resist any change. The church is one of the most change-averse institutions there is. Now, generally speaking, young people are more open, hopeful, and excited about the future. However, as they grow older, they too become very attached to the predictable and the knowable status quo. How would it be if we as people of faith were not afraid of the uncertainty of the future, but instead excited about the future for opportunities for God to do amazing things. What if, instead of being anxious about the unknown future, we were to be like children who are counting the days to Christmas with excitement? What if, we were possi- if it were possible to, instead of having anticipatory anxiety about what may go wrong in the future, we have anticipatory joy 
for the surprising things God is about to do in the future. Would it not be a wonderful approach to life to get up in the mornings not dreading the day, but to allow yourself to be surprised by what may come across your path that day? Now, I believe that the Judeo-Christian tradition actually views the future as an exciting play field of God's work. Yes, the future is, in fact, an opportunity for God to do marvelous things. Time and again, prophets like Isaiah and others are excited and enthusiastic about the future. God will intervene and bring about good things. And because of their emphasis on the future, some people see prophets as fortune tellers. They are not. They are people who know history, and they know God's involvement in their history. They often remind their people that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is part of their history, part of their world and their life. And they remind them that God loves them, cares for them, provides for them. And all they have to do is to look back on their history and see how God has been involved. And their history shows that God has always been there for them when they were slaves in Egypt, when they wandered in the wilderness, when they entered the promised land. And because God has always been there for them in the past, the prophets time and again reminded them that their future is in God's hand and therefore not to be feared. Time and again, they are reminded that the future will provide many opportunities for God to do amazing things. And the reason for their optimistic view of the future is their trust in God. A trust in a God who has always been trustworthy. And the comfort of knowing that God is trustworthy liberated them to live with enthusiasm, with courage, and an unbridled joy. Now, this does not mean that ancient Israel never wrestled with the same kind of questions about life and fear of the future that we wrestle with. They did. This is why they were so often reminded that God who made a covenant would not forsake them. The prophet Isaiah says, But there will be no gloom for those who are in anguish. In the latter time, he will make glorious the way of the sea. And then he continues saying, For a child has been born for us, a son given to us. Authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. The authors of the New Testament and the early church view Jesus as the one that is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Luke's Gospel, and for that matter, the other Gospels as well, built on the Jewish tradition. Jesus was, after all, a Jew born of the offspring as the offspring of David. And as the story of the birth of the Messiah unfolds in Luke's gospel, we encounter a marginalized group of people of their time, shepherds. Theirs was a dangerous and lonely job. Dangerous because thieves and wild animals were a constant threat. Lonely because shepherds would spend weeks in the field taking care of their flock. They were dirty, smelly people, hungry people with their fair share of fear, fear of real threats, but without any doubt, fear of what the future holds for them who had little resources. And shepherds in the Gospel of Luke became the first witnesses of an event that directly addressed the one emotion that enslaved them and are still enslaving modern people, fear. While they were doing their job, living in the fields, an angel of the Lord said to them, Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. You see, Luke describes their emotions explicitly when he said, They were terrified. Do not be afraid, for see, I'm bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. 
To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. So the words that introduced the very first Christmas are, Do not be afraid. In the Bible, God tells people more than a hundred times, Fear not, or do not be afraid. And as I have mentioned to you before, according to the Gospel of Luke, the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, replaces fear with great joy. Luke makes no secret that this child, Jesus, was born into a real harsh world and had to deal with real world problems. He was born during the time of Emperor Augustus and Quirinius the governor, powerful people living in a turbulent world of power politics, social upheaval, and many fearful victims of conflicting interests just like ours. Every year we celebrate Christmas, and we think back on what happened on that first Christmas. We all know the Christmas story of a young, vulnerable couple, the birth of an infant, powerful people like King Herod wanting to get rid of Jesus and angels singing. And when we think about the first Christmas, we become nostalgic and even emotional. The little baby Jesus, the fact that there was no room for them in the inn, his vulnerable and young parents, this year even more so. All of us have cropped cropped up emotions, for we have all suffered a dramatic sense of loss. We are, after all, in the midst of a -a once-in-a-hundred-year pandemic. We feel vulnerable. We feel scared. We don't know if and when things will become normal again. And during a time of hardship and suffering, many of us idealize the past. We find comfort in knowing how the past turned out. We tend to think less about the future, for the future is uncertain, scary, and we do not know what will happen. So we think about the good old days, this Christmas perhaps more so than ever. But the authors of the Bible were not that interested in nostalgia. The Gospels, in fact, spend very little time on the details of the first Christmas. The Gospel of Mark and John do not even include the birth of Jesus or Mary or Joseph. So even though the birth of Christ is important, as it tells of the beginning of Christ's earthly life, it should not distract us from the rest of Jesus' life and God's plan for humankind. You see, the Gospels are actually more interested in the person of Jesus, his words and his actions, his whole life, not only his birth, shows us how God is at work. Jesus is God's way of assuring us that God is trustworthy and God is involved in our history. This Jesus who was born as a baby grew up, gave himself in love to the world. He died, but was also raised to conquer our biggest fear of the future, death. And in his life, death and resurrection, we find comfort. We find courage and assurance that the future is indeed in God's hands. And this means that there is no reason for us to give in to our fears, whether they are the fear for the fe- of the future, fear of the other, fear of rejection, fear of disappointment, or even fear of dying. The theological truth is this. God, who has shown himself to be trustworthy, even to to the death of his Son, will be reliable and trustworthy in our future. There is therefore no reason for us to dread dread getting up in the morning or to worry about next year because of God's actions in the past. We don't have to be anxious of the future for a God who loves us unconditionally will provide. So instead of spending emotional and physical energy worrying about the unknown future, I believe that we should use all of our energy to focus on living with joy, 
identifying and using the opportunities that God provides to serve others. Perhaps instead of worrying about the unknown future, we could look for ways to work on the things that will make our world a better and gentler place. The question is whether we are noticing and using the opportunities that God is providing. The birth of Christ in a manger is a reminder that God has chosen to be part of our world, our history, and our future. There is therefore no reason, no need to fear. So let me ask again, what is the one thing you would change in the world? What is holding you back to work on this? There may be other reasons for not working on it, but fear, fear of the future should not be one. Amen. Let us now affirm our faith in the living God in the words as they are in the bulletin. I believe the word was in the form of God and did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. He emptied himself, took the form of a servant, and was born in our own likeness. I believe he humbled himself and became obedient unto death. I believe God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. I believe that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow, every knee in heaven and on earth and under the earth. I believe that every tongue will confess 
that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. And now let the peace of Christ rule in your heart, since as members of one body you were called to peace. The peace of Christ be with you. Sisters and brothers in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Supper which we are about to celebrate is a feast of remembrance, of communion, and of hope. We come in remembrance that our Lord Jesus Christ became flesh and blood like us and fulfilled for us all obedience to the divine law, even to the bitter and shameful end of the cross. We come to have communion with the same Christ who has promised to be with us always, even to the end of the world. And we come in hope, believing that this bread and this cup are a pledge and foretaste of the feast of love of which we shall partake when his kingdom has fully come. Since by death, resurrection, and ascension, Christ has obtained for us the life-giving Spirit who unites us all in one body, so are we to receive this supper in true love, mindful of the communion of saints. This is the Lord's table. You are welcome at the Lord's table, so come, for all things are now ready. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God, for it is holy and right to do so. Holy and right it is, and our joyful duty to give thanks to you at all times and in all places, O Lord, our Creator, almighty and everlasting God. You created heaven with all its hosts and the earth with all its plenty. You have given us life and being and preserve us by your providence, but you have shown us the fullness of your love in sending into the world your Son, Jesus Christ, the eternal Word, made flesh for us and for our salvation for the precious gift of this mighty Savior who has reconciled us to you. We praise and bless you, God, with your whole church on earth and with all the company of heaven. We worship and adore your glorious name. God, we remember in the supper the perfect sacrifice offered once on the cross by our Lord Jesus Christ for the sin of the whole world. In the joy of his resurrection and in the expectation of his coming again, we offer ourselves to you as holy and living sacrifices. And together we proclaim the mystery of the faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. The, word on the, the Lord, on the same night he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after the same manner also, he took the cup when they had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. The bread which we break is the communion of the body of Christ. The cup of blessing which we bless is the communion of the blood of Christ.
brothers and sisters, since the Lord has now fed us at his table, let us praise God's holy name with heartfelt thanksgiving. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who has not spared his own son, but delivered him up for us all, and given us all things with him. Therefore shall my mouth and heart show forth the praise of the Lord from this time forth forevermore. Amen. We praise and thank you, O Lord, that you have fed us at your table. Grateful for your gifts and mindful of the communion of your saints, we offer to you our prayers for all people. God of compassion, we remember before you the poor and the afflicted, the sick and the dying, prisoners and all who are lonely, the victims of war, injustice, and inhumanity, and all others who suffer from whatever their sufferings may be called. O Lord of Providence, who holds the destiny of the nations in your hand, we pray for our country. Inspire the hearts and minds of our leaders that they, together with all our nation, may first seek your kingdom and righteousness so that order, liberty, and peace may dwell with your people. Creator God, we pray for all nations and peoples. Take away the mistrust and lack of understanding that divide your creatures. Increase in us the recognition that we are all your people, all your children. O Savior God, look upon your church in its struggle upon the earth. Have mercy on its weakness. Bring to an end its unhappy divisions and scatter its fears. Look also upon the ministry of your church here. Increase our courage. Strengthen our faith. Inspire our witness to all people, even to the ends of the earth. Author of grace and God of love, send your Holy Spirit blessing to your children. Keep our hearts and thoughts in Jesus Christ, your Son, our only Savior, who has taught us to pray, saying in one voice, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. <laughs>
People of God, you are reminded that God loves you. You need not fear, because God will always be with you. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God Almighty, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen. Merry Christmas. Thank you.